everyone's still here, good. So as you know, we always save the best for last. So in this uh, coming session, we're gonna do something which I think should be mandatory in every conference, and that is that, yes, it's very important to bring people from companies, academia, even startups, uh, to talk, and I think that it's also very important to bring people from the field. In, uh, in Hebrew, there's a really you know, famous quote that says, en chacham keval nisayon, or in English, experience is the best teacher. So we want to dedicate this next session to people who actually do this stuff every single day, fighting in the trenches, to come here and share from their knowledge and experience with us, and I think that's going to be one of the most rewarding sessions of this entire conference. So, without further ado, I would like to invite the first speaker of this session to the stage. I would like to invite Mr. Chris Inglis, the former Deputy Director of the NSA, the Managing Director of Paladin Capital, a distinguished visiting professor from the U.S. Naval Academy. Chris, please, the stage is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. As the other speakers have said, it really is impossible to know whether there's 10 or 150 out there. So with your permission, I'll stare into the vacant distance. And I know that eight of you from the United States Naval Academy shout out for the Naval Academy midshipmen that came along with me today. So thanks for being here. I think we can call this the, uh, oh, I can see you all now. I think we can call this the poster child session. I'll be the first poster child up, which is based upon some personal professional experience you know, what are some lessons learned? And I'll give you, I think, your money's worth in the next 12 minutes. Of course, um, having been the Deputy Director of the National Security Agency, I was there as the Chief Operating Officer for the better part of eight years. Uh, one of those years was the year that Mr. Snowden came out. So you would be familiar with the material on this particular slide. Uh, it turns out that uh, the picture in the upper, upper left-hand corner is a picture, a movie shot from the movie Snowden. It's actually the actor that's depicted in that chart. Edward Snowden himself is in the lower right-hand corner of this particular chart. Um, I would simply observe, and this is all I'll ever say about uh, Edward Snowden's motives, is there are two actors depicted on this chart. One of them happens to be Edward Snowden. Um, but having said that, um, what I'd like to actually describe a little bit about is what was that about, not from a kind of motivation perspective or even from that standpoint, you know, what the downstream damage. That's probably self-evident at this point in time, and those will play out in the natural course of things. What I'd like to say something about was, what was about, what was it about the system that allowed that to happen in the first place? In the live and learn modality, of what then are lessons that we can take? And what would I convey to you, or what would I convey to Chris Inglis in the spring of 2013 of, you ought to think about this if you're gonna defend against the insider threat. Um, and I will tell you that at this point in time, with all due respect to Edward, this is not about how to catch Edward Snowden in terms of what he did but rather what are the general principles that you establish so that looking forward, you can determine how do you actually think about this in the general terms, but with enough precision that you'll catch the next one, which frankly will not operate like the last one. Uh, to start, would simply say that what we used to assume is indicated on this chart, um, and these are really useful to stop and ponder. I would say that this might not have been at some distinct place in time, but think back along, along the last 10, 20, 30 years in terms of the defense of enterprises. And this is a reasonably fair set of assumptions that those of us who essentially started defending discrete computers, discrete small sets of computers, um, larger enterprises, perhaps had this as a bias. Um, we used to think that existential threat largely came from the outside. That's where most of the malicious actors live on a daily basis, not from the inside. Uh, that inherently then causes us to think that um, the outsiders are the ones that we should spend most of our time and attention on, um, and therefore the insiders being inherently more trustworthy because we went to great pains to find them, vet them, and bring them in, um, perhaps deserve less of our time and attention. Second assumption that uh, comes from uh, historical um, experience is that we know that there's a low probability of an insider threat in terms of quantity, the number of events that would be attributable to an insider, um, and that sometimes then gives us a bias that we'll focus on those things that are more likely to happen without regard to consequence. And simply observe at this point, as I will later in the talk, that a low probability event with high consequence probably should have more of our time and attention than a whole span of high probability, low consequence events. The third thing um, that's implicit in the kind of the way we've organized, and many organizations are still in this place, is that we perceive that security can be managed independently, sub-optimized in at least three different stovepipes. There's, of course, the information technology stovepipe. We're in the room talking a lot about that today. 
about the software, the hardware, the doctrine, the procedures that are attended to that. But there's a human resources look, which ultimately tells you something about the trustworthiness or not of individuals, the permissions that you should or shouldn't give to them, the way they exercise those. And there are all sorts of indicators that come from the human look as opposed to how they simply perform on the network itself. And then finally, of course, there's the physical security. Locks and gates and guards and cameras and things of that sort. If you manage those independently, you allow for the possibility that there'll be some tipping and queuing from those. But generally how that works, if you have three stovepipes, is you have to cross some sort of a threshold inside of that stovepipe in order for it to be meritorious enough to cross over. Unless, of course, you think of this as perhaps an atomic hole from the bottom up, and you allow the tipping and queuing to occur before you get to a meritorious security event, such that acting in combination two of these or three of these could see something that one of these could not. And then finally, the last by implication um, kind of strategy that I will show doesn't work so well in the face of an insider threat in the year 2017, let alone 2013, is the strategy of reacting well. This simply says that we believe that we'll kind of be able to detect this in time to catch this as it races to the virtual door. Um, of course, we don't do that in the physical world anymore, despite the fact that cockpit doors are strapped three ways from Sunday and have a very strong lock on them. Our strategy with respect to physical acts of terror are not, let's catch them on the airplane. Neither should our strategy with respect to insiders be, we'll catch them in the act, we'll catch them essentially as they hit the door. And it's a little bit problematic as to how you do that amongst a trusted population. So if those are the things that perhaps are the set case that we used to assume, uh, let me give you a very thumbnail sketch of what the insider kind of strategy would be at the National Security Agency in spring of 2013. If you had asked me and if I was thoughtful enough in those days to say, here's how we defend the enterprise that is constituted by the information technology, the people bound to that, and the procedures to essentially defend our enterprise against threats. Um, we would have said that we would have done a pretty robust job of the PROTECT mission, the traditional information assurance. What do you do about the software, the hardware, the setup, the patching, to make sure that you, in fact, have a defensible enterprise? We would have had a strong application of defend measures, believing that there was more than the possibility of breach, probably the probability of breach. But mind you, at this time, we would have had a bias towards outsiders, literal outsiders, coming across the berm. And therefore, we would have practiced defense in depth. Uh, we were not mindless of insiders. We were certainly mindful of them. But our traditions, our practice over the better part of 60 years before had been that if you go to great lengths to find people to whom you believe you can extend trust, you vet them in extraordinary ways. We might today call that extreme vetting. Uh, but you vet them, um, even to the point within the United States system of giving them a polygraph before you then place them on the line, you have some reason to believe that you can extend trust to them. You can give them some ability to act without day-to-day uh, -day or perhaps moment-by-moment -moment oversight, that you allow them to live in an envelope of trust, and you essentially monitor the margins of that envelope. And if they get to that margin, um, you assume at that point in time that you still have time to perhaps get them back on the straight and narrow, pick them up, dust them off. If it was an inadvertent error, hug them, send them on their way. If it was an inadvertent or malicious error, the assumption is, is that the size of the box was small enough that you've, you've constrained the damage at a time and place to where you can recover from that and then take whatever HR actions, human resource actions are appropriate. Uh, we'll come back to that. And then, of course, we had forensics, which is that in the face of something that we knew had happened, that's an historical over-the-shoulder look, we could actually do some expert research and quickly determine what happened and therefore put ourselves in a place where we would make sure that didn't happen again or reduce that possibility. Um, all of those in combination were a reasonably robust strategy, um, but why didn't that work? Well, let's kind of review again the bidding. The reality is, is that uh, the insider privilege yields increasingly an existential vulnerability. It might not be an existential threat, meaning there might not be some person who is willing to do this, but it is in fact an existential vulnerability. Why is that? We have fewer and fewer people who have more and more privileges because we've taken people out of the system with automation, machinery, all the things we've done to concentrate more leverage, more ability in individuals. Um, there are still going to be system administrators. It's an issue as to whether you have too many or whether you've not been careful and discreet about perhaps limiting their privilege. But there's still going to be somebody or a set of somebodies in your system who have enough privilege, who have enough leverage to do you harm. And it does, in fact, constitute an existential threat um, if you, in fact, don't, at the same time you trust them, verify what they're doing. 
of the low probability consequence, or the low probability that there was an insider that I mentioned early. Um, in the case of an insider, if point one is true, that it's existential, essentially gives you this combination of low probability, high consequence, puts you into the range where this is a serious, because it's the product of those two things that you worry about. This is a serious issue, and probably you ought to move your gaze, not simply by saying, do I have the actual threat, but is this a vulnerability that's going to come on me so fast when that threat occurs that I ought to deal with that when it's a vulnerability? Um, IT behaviors, physical security, um, and, and the HR, they're all essentially embodied in a person as they race across those. Consider the possibility that there's a person who has a workplace incident. They decide not to get mad, rather they're going to get even. Uh, they have the privileges um, that are attendant to their ability to get even. Uh, they then elect to operate low and slow for a period of months after that. Um, you've got an HR clue that something perhaps is amiss. If that clue tips and cues the information technology security stovepipe to say this person with privilege perhaps is a heightened risk, and if that then gives you a sense that you ought to be watching the physical disposition of how this person operates on the campus, do they go into privileged spaces, do they have a work-life balance that perhaps is somewhat different, and if it's different on certain days, why is it different? You begin to get an approximation of how you might combine those three looks to have a better sense as to, should I be more worried about this person who exhibits their activities through those three different lenses? If, in fact, you don't do that, then what you're going to do is to essentially treat these as three independent stovepipes. You'll essentially revert back to what I would call a transaction mentality that says, if a given transaction in one of those stovepipes exceeds a threshold, then and only then do you try to figure if there's a correlation in the other stovepipe. And what you essentially do is fall prey to somebody who says, I'm clever enough to essentially beat you low and slow. And then finally, um, the significant threats, they can move faster than you can react. So a strategy that used to be of, we'll simply react well, we're really good at reacting well, tends to be that that's more fun, um, simply can't work in the face of somebody that's clever enough, perhaps devoted enough, um, to essentially seize the moment through his audacity or agility and race you to the door, they win the race. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with three slides that then say, what then are the lessons learned? Because more than simply being a poster child, right, I need to say something about what do you then do about that? I would say that there are some technologies, right, that are clearly useful for this purpose, um, that while not new and novel, are not in wide, wide use. Those technologies classically can start to say, let's not just look at transactions and compare them to some prior benchmark, but let's look at behavior. That's a fundamentally different look. You're not looking through a soda straw discreetly at action after action after action. You're standing back and saying, I want to understand the nature of this behavior. I want to understand that this behavior is anomalous or not in the context of itself. Um, some degree of automation can help in that regard. Some degree of artificial intelligence can help in that regard. But it's a horizontal look at the system as opposed to a vertical look through the soda straw. Second thing, of course, is that you need to do holistic security. Combine those three stovepipes. Again, that's not often done. And oftentimes in a corporation, especially in, in a corporation because we have a traditional look at things like risk through a very kind of focused and, and expert committee, we essentially have the reporting chains of those such that those don't reasonably connect anywhere. And if they do, they typically connect at the COO or the CEO. And then finally, I haven't said enough about this one, but the third ring of the puzzle is culture. I mean, this culture for me cuts two ways. And I'll just give you a very quick insight and then step off the stage. But the culture is important because people are, in fact, the most uh, variable, the most uh, important, the most agile, the most creative, the most unpredictable component of any system. And to be sure, cyber as a system is as much about the people as it is about the technology. You need to solve that piece. And there are two pieces that I would recommend in terms of culture. Certainly, there should be accountability that always comes in. You need to make sure that people understand what their roles, obligations are, hold them accountable to that. But more importantly, there needs to be this sense that you have bound that person in all the positive ways that are appropriate to the larger enterprise so that you don't suffer the fate of an organization of one. Somebody who's in your organization, who physically looks like they're betwixt and amongst counterparts that they have some kindred um, obligations or spirit with, but in fact they're acting as an organization of one, exercising their own individual aspirations, wants, and needs. I will tell you that in the case of Edward Snowden, he was a contractor. If you're a contractor in a federal organization within the United States, you are therefore by law treated as a commodity. Um, you're not special because you by law are told that you simply are supposed to exercise that function. You are not therefore given the same sort of view in terms of having an enduring relationship or proposition with the company that you would if you're a civilian employee. 
that in and of itself, in my view, does not justify in one way, shape, or form anything that Mr. Snowden did, but if you miss that opportunity to perhaps have one more safety net, one more check on what perhaps might mot motivate somebody to act as they do, then you've missed bringing culture to bear on your behalf. Having said all of that, I'd simply like to close with a fond um, kind of thank you, a, a, a warm thank you to TAU for setting up this conference. It's a wonderful conference. Um, I think, like everyone else, I was wondering this morning when the room was packed, who's defending our networks? Uh, but we'll all get back to that, all the wiser for having exchanged some of these best practices. All the best.